Welcome to 2024 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Welcome to lesson number eight, titled Wisdom for Righteous Living, ready for teaching on Sabbath, February 24. It's from the Sabbath School lesson series, Psalms, authored by Dr. Dragoslav Sandrak and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, February 17. Before we start, let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word, because it's the place of wisdom for righteous living. And as we study our lesson this week, we pray that your word will speak to us through your Holy Spirit. May these words come alive. May we know that you are there for each of us. And whatever our situation, wherever we are in the world, wherever we are in our lives, that you are there for us and that you are faithful. And Lord, as we open your word, we just pray that each of our families may be blessed, each of our churches may be blessed, and that we may be able to show to others the love that we get from you through your word. And today I'd like to particularly pray for Margaret Molinelli from Montana and uh, Venus Wallen and her extended family and those experiencing hard times through drought and floods and starvation and sickness and war, wherever they are, Lord, and for Sheldon, Tamara and Sefton and for Danovan Henry and Dushan Vai Thillingram and Doreen Hines and her family and Ovai Kone in Kola Village in Papua New Guinea, just north of where I live. I pray that each of these people who've asked for prayer will be blessed, Lord, and that you'll be with them. And as we open your word now, Please walk with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Let's read that again, Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. As we've seen, God's grace provides for the forgiveness of sins and it creates a new heart in the repentant sinner who now lives by faith. God's Word also provides instructions for righteous living, as you read in Psalm 119 verses 9 to 16. How can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? With my whole heart I have sought you. O let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Keeping God's law is by no means a legalistic observance of rules, but Life in an intimate relationship with God, a life full of blessing. As we read in Psalm 119, verse 1, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. And then Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine. In the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants, all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. However, the life of the righteous person is not without temptations. 
Sometimes the righteous can be tempted by the cunning nature of sin, as you read in Psalm 141, verses 2 to 4. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies, and even fall to that temptation. God allows times of testing to let his children's faithfulness or unfaithfulness be clearly revealed. If God's children heed God's instructions and admonishment, their faith will be purified and their trust in the Lord strengthened. Wisdom for righteous living is gained through the dynamics of life with God amid temptations and challenges. Thus, the prayer that God would teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom reflects an ongoing commitment to walk in faithfulness to God. Psalm 90 verse 12 tells us that. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Sunday, February 8, your word I have hidden in my heart. Read Psalm 119 verses 1 to 16 and verses 161 to 168. How should we keep God's commandments and what are the blessings that come from doing that? Psalm 119, beginning at verse 1, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do not iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed." when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments." Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies, as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word." And verses 161 to 168. Princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. I hate and abhor lying, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Lord, I hope for your salvation, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. The Bible depicts a daily life of faith as a pilgrimage or walk with God in his path of righteousness. The life of faith is maintained by walking in the law of the Lord, as we read in Psalm 119 verse 1, and by walking in the light of your countenance in Psalm 89 verse 15. Let's check that one. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. These are by no means two different walks. Walking in the light of God's countenance implies upholding God's law. Equally, walking in the law of the Lord involves seeking God with the whole heart, as you read in verses 1, 2 and 10 of Psalm 119. 
Being undefiled in the way is another way the Psalms describe the righteous life in verse 1. Undefiled describes a sacrifice without blemish that is acceptable to God, as you read about in Exodus 12, verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Likewise, the life of the righteous individual, which is a living sacrifice, is to be undefiled by love for sin. We read about that in Romans 12 verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. A life devoted to God is also a perfect way, meaning that the person assumes a right direction in life that is pleasing to God. As we read in Psalm 101, verse 2 and 6, which I'm reading this time from the NIV. Verse 2, I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will walk in my house with blameless heart. And verse 6, My eyes will be on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. He whose walk is blameless will minister to me. And we also look at the same time at Psalm 18 and verse 32. It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. Keeping God's commandments has nothing to do with a legalistic observance of divine rules. On the contrary, it consists of a good understanding of the difference between right and wrong and good and evil. As we read in Psalm 111 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments his praise endures forever. And we're also redirected here to First Chronicles chapter 22 and verse 12. Only may the Lord give you wisdom and understanding and give you charge concerning Israel that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. And it involves the whole person, not merely outward actions. Being undefiled, keeping God's commandments and seeking God with the whole heart are inseparable attitudes of life, as we read in Psalm 119 verses 1 and 2. God's commandments are a revelation of God's will for the world. They instruct people on how to become wise and to live in freedom and peace, as you read in verses 7 to 11 of Psalm 119. I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And then verse 133. Direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. The psalmist delights in the law because the law assures him of God's faithfulness. As you read in Psalm 119, verse 77, Let your tender mercies come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. And verse 174, I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble, we read in verse 165. The image of stumbling depicts moral failure. As the lamp to the psalmist's feet of verse 105, God's word protects us from temptations, as we read in verse 110. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not strayed from your precepts. And so to finish today, how did Christ demonstrate the power of God's word in his life? Well, we'll read Matthew 4 verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. 
Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. What should this tell us about the power that comes from a heart set on obeying God's law? Monday, February 19, teach us to number our days. Read Psalm 90, Psalm 102 verse 11, and Psalm 103 verses 14 to 16. What is the human predicament? Psalm 90, beginning at verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or Ever you had formed the earth and the world. Even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it is cut down and withers. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh." The days of our lives are seventy years, and, if by reason of strength they are eighty years, yet their boast is only labour and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. O oh, satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And Psalm 102, verse 11, My days are like a shadow that lengthens, and I wither away like grass. And Psalm 103, verses 14 to 16, For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. Fallen human existence is but a vapour in the light of eternity. A thousand years in God's sight is like a watch in the night, which lasted three or four hours. We read in verse 4, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. Compared to divine time, a human lifetime flies away, we read in verse 10. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labour and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. 
The strongest among humans are analogous to the weakest among plants, we read in verses 5 and 6. And in Psalm 103, verses 15 and 16, we read, As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field so he flourishes, for the wind passes over it and is gone, and its place remembers it no more. Yet, Even that short life is filled with labour and sorrow, we read in verse 10 of Psalm 90. Even secular people who have no belief in God mourn and lament the shortness of life, especially in contrast to the eternity that's out there and that they know threatens to go on without them. Psalm 90 places the human predicament in the context of God's care for people as their creator. The Lord has been the dwelling place of his people in all generations. We read in verses 1 and 2, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth, or even you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The Hebrew word ma'on, M-A, O-N, or dwelling place, portrays the Lord as the shelter or refuge of his people in Psalm 91 and verse 9. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. God restrains his righteous wrath and extends his grace anew. The psalmist exclaims, Who knows the power of your anger? in Psalm 90 verse 11, implying that no one has ever experienced the full effect of God's anger against sin, and so there is hope for people to repent and gain wisdom for righteous living. Wisdom in the Bible depicts not merely intelligence, but reverence for God. The wisdom that we need is knowing how to number our days, we read in verse 12 of Psalm 90. If we can number our days, it means that our days are limited and that we know that they are limited. Wise living means living with an awareness of life's transience that leads to faith and obedience. This wisdom is gained only through repentance, we read in verses 8 You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. And verse 12, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And God's gifts of forgiveness, compassion and mercy in verses 13 and 14. Return, O Lord, how long, and have compassion on your servants. O satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Our fundamental problem stems not from the fact that we are created as human beings, but from sin and from what sin has wrought in our world. Its devastating effects are seen everywhere and in every person. Thanks to Jesus, however, a way has been made for us out of our human predicament, as we read in John chapter 1 and verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John 3, verses 14 to 21. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done 
in God. Otherwise, we would have no hope at all. And so to finish the day, no matter how quickly our life passes, what promise do we have in Jesus? And what hope would we have without him? We find that in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Tuesday, February 20, The Lord's Test Read Psalm 81, verses 7 and 8, 95, verses 7 to 11, 105, verses 17 to 22. What does divine testing involve in these texts? First of all, Psalm 81, verses 7 to 8. You called in trouble, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you, O Israel, if you will listen to me. And Psalm 95, verses 7 to 11. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For forty years I was grieved with that generation, and said, It is a people who go astray in in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And Psalm 105, beginning at verse 17, he sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters, he was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his elders wisdom. Meribah is a place where Israel tested God by challenging his faithfulness and power to provide for their needs. As we read in Exodus 17 verses 1 to 7, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it that you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And then Psalm 95, verses 8 and 9, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. The Lord says, Don't harden your hearts, as Israel did at Meribah, as they did at Massa in the wilderness. For there your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw everything I did. Psalm 81 makes an intriguing reversal and interprets the same event as the time when God tested Israel in Psalm 81 verse 7 and by their disobedience and lack of trust in verse 11 the people failed God's test. 
The reference to Mirabah conveys a twofold message. First, God's people must not repeat the mistakes of past generations. Instead, they are to trust God and walk in His way, as we read in Psalm 81 and verse 13. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. Second, although the people failed the test, God came to their rescue when they were in trouble. We read in verse 7, God's saving grace in the past gives an assurance of God's grace to new generations. Psalm 105 shows that the trials were God's means of testing Joseph's trust in God's foretelling of his future. As we read in Genesis 37, 5 to 10, Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding the sheaves in the field. Then, behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood up around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And Psalm 105, verses 19 to 22, until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions, to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his elders wisdom. The Hebrew sarap, T-S-A-R-A-P, Tested, in verse 19, conveys a sense of purging, refining or purifying. Thus, the goal of God's testing of Joseph's faith was to remove any doubt in God's promise and to strengthen Joseph's trust in God's guidance. The goal of divine discipline is to strengthen God's children and to prepare them for the fulfilment of the promise as shown in Joseph's example in verses 20 to 22 that we've just read. However, rejection of God's instruction results in growing stubbornness and hardening of an obstinate person's heart. Ellen White wrote in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 146, God requires prompt and unquestioning obedience of his law. But men are asleep or paralysed by the deceptions of Satan, who suggests excuses and subterfuges and conquers their scruples, saying, as he said to Eve in the garden, You shall not surely die. Disobedience not only hardens the heart and conscience of the guilty one, but it tends to corrupt the faith of others. That which looked very wrong to them at first gradually loses this appearance by being constantly before them, till finally they question whether it is really sin and unconsciously fall into the same error. End of quote. And so to finish the day. What has been your own experience with how sin hardens the heart? Why should that thought drive us to the cross, where we can find the power to obey? Wednesday, February 21, Deceitfulness of the Wicked Way Read Psalm 141. What does the psalmist pray for? Psalm 141, beginning at verse 1. Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. 
Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity. And do not let me eat of their delicacies. Let the righteous strike me. It shall be a kindness, and let them rebuke me. It shall be as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. For still my prayer is against the deeds of the wicked. Their judges are overthrown by the sides of the cliff, and they hear my words, for they are sweet. Our bones are scattered at the mouth of the grave, as when one ploughs and breaks up the earth. But my eyes are upon you, O God, the Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not leave my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares they have laid for me, and from the traps of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets, while I escape safely. Psalm 141 is a prayer for protection from temptations from within and from without. The psalmist is not only endangered by the schemes of the wicked, as in verses 9 and 10, keep me from the snares they have laid for me and from the traps of the workers of iniquity, let the wicked fall into their own nets while I escape safely, but also is tempted to act like the wicked. The first weak point is self-control in speech, and the psalmist prays that the Lord will keep watch over the door of his lips. In verse 3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. This image alludes to the guarding of city gates that, in biblical times, protected the city. The temptation is also whether God's child will yield to the counsel of the righteous or be lured by the delicacies of the wicked. As you read in verses 4 and 5, Do not incline my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Let the righteous strike me. It shall be a kindness, and let them rebuke me. It shall be as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. For still my prayer is against the deeds of the wicked. The psalmist depicts his heart as a primary threat, because there the real battle happens. Only unceasing prayer of complete trust and devotion to God can save God's child from temptation. We read in verse 2, Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Read Psalm 1 verse 1 and 141 verse 4. What is the progressive and cunning character of temptation depicted here? First of all, Psalm 1 verse 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. And Psalm 141 verse 4, Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Psalm 141 verse 4 depicts the progressive nature of temptation. First, the heart is inclined toward evil. Second, it practices evil deeds. The meaning in Hebrew underlines the repetitive character of the action. And third, the heart eats of the delicacies of the wicked, namely, accepts their evil practices as something desirable. Likewise, in Psalm 1 verse 1, the temptation comes to prevent God's child from walking in the Lord's way by causing him to walk with the wicked, stand in the path of the sinners, and finally sit with the scornful. Sinners, wicked and scornful, we are not to be like them or let them lead us away from the Lord. These psalms describe the progressive, alluring and cunning character of temptation, which underscores the fact that only total dependency on the Lord can secure one's victory. They stress the importance of the words that one speaks and listens to amid temptation. 
The end of both the wicked and the righteous should teach the people to seek wisdom from God, as we read in Psalm 1, verses 4 to 6. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And Psalm 141, verses 8 to 10, But my eyes are upon you, O God the Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not leave my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares they have laid for me, and from the traps of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets, while I escape safely. Yet in both Psalms, the final vindication of God's children remains in the future. And so to finish today, this means that the believers are called to patiently trust God and to wait upon Him. Thursday, February 22, Blessings of Righteous Living Read Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3, Psalm 112, verses 1 to 9, and Psalm 128. What blessings are promised for those who revere the Lord? Psalm 1, beginning at verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree, planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper." And Psalm 112, verses 1 to 9. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever, his horn will be exalted with honour. And then Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labour of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine. In the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants, all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Of the many blessings promised to those who revere the Lord, peace is perhaps one of the greatest. Psalm 1 depicts the righteous by a simile of a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, as you read in Psalm 1 and verse 3 just previously, and Jeremiah chapter 17 and verses 7 to 8, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when he comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. And Ezekiel 47 and verse 12, along the bank of the river, on this side and that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary.' 
Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. This simile identifies the source of all blessings, namely abiding in God's presence in his sanctuary and enjoying uninterrupted and loving relationship with God. Unlike the wicked who are portrayed as chaff with no stability, place and future, the righteous are like a fruitful tree with roots, a place near God and eternal life. Psalm 128 verses 2 and 3 evoke the blessings of the messianic kingdom, where sitting under one's own vine and fig tree is a symbol of peace and prosperity. Psalm 128 verses 2 and 3. When you eat the labours of your hand, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine. In the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants, all around your table. And we look too then at Micah chapter 4 and verse 4. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. The blessing of peace from Jerusalem conveys hope in the Messiah, who will end evil and restore peace in the world. We've got that comment in Psalm 122, verses 6 to 8. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, Peace be within you, and Psalm 128, verses 5 and 6. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. From the Great Controversy, page 675, we read, In the Bible, the inheritance of the saved is called a country. Hebrews 11, 14 to 16. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. There the heavenly shepherd leads his flock to fountains of living waters. The tree of life yields its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the service of the nations. There are ever-flowing streams, clear as crystal, and beside them waving trees cast their shadows upon the path prepared for the ransomed of the Lord. There the wide-spreading plains swell into hills of beauty, and the mountains of God rear their lofty summits. On those peaceful plains, beside those living streams, God's people, so long pilgrims and wanderers, shall find a home. End of quote. The New Testament describes the fulfilment of that hope in Christ's second advent and the creation of the new world, as you read in Matthew 26, verse 29. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And then so gloriously in Revelation chapter 21, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then He who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. 
And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have that part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then... One of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates and names written on them which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, twelve thousand furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, one hundred and forty-four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel." The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honour into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honour of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles, or causes an abomination, or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Therefore, while the righteous receive many blessings in this life, the fullness of God's favour awaits them when God's kingdom is fully restored at the end of time. And so to finish the day, Why is the cross and what happened there the guarantee of the promises found in the New Testament of what God has in store for us? How can we get comfort from these promises even now? Friday, February 23. Further Thought In these modern times, obtaining wisdom seems not to be so desirable as achieving happiness. People would rather be happy than wise. However, can we truly be happy and live a fulfilled life without godly wisdom? The Psalms clearly say that we cannot. The good news is that we are not asked to choose between wisdom and happiness. Godly wisdom brings genuine happiness. A simple example from the Hebrew language can illustrate this point. In Hebrew, the word step in plural asherei, A-S-H-U-R-E-Y, sounds very much like the word happiness, asherei, A-S-H-R-E-Y. 
Although we miss this association in English translations, it conveys a powerful message. Steps holding to God's path leads to a happy life. And we have some references here to look at. The first is Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sits in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. And Psalm 17, verse 5. Uphold my steps in your paths, that my footsteps may not slip. And Psalm 37, verse 31, The law of his God is in his heart, none of his steps shall slide. And Psalm 44, verse 18, Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. And Psalm 89, verse 15, Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound, They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. And Psalm 119, verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. In the Bible, neither wisdom nor happiness are an abstract concept. They are a real experience. They are found in relationship with God, which consists of revering, praising, finding strength in and trusting God. Psalm 25.14 says that The secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. Thank God, Ellen White writes in Steps to Christ, page 118, for the bright pictures which he has presented to us. Let us group together the blessed assurances of his love that we may look upon them continually. The Son of God, leaving his Father's throne, clothing his divinity with humanity, that he might rescue man from the power of Satan, his triumph in our behalf, opening heaven to men, revealing to human vision the presence chamber where the deity unveils his glory, the fallen race uplifted from the pit of ruin into which sin had plunged it, and brought again into connection with the infinite God, and have Having endured the divine test through faith in our Redeemer, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and exalted to his throne. These are the pictures which God would have us contemplate. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, how can God's word become the source of one's delight and not merely instruction? How is feeding on God's Word related to abiding in Jesus Christ, the Word? First of all, we look at John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John 15 verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. And verse 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Question 2, What happens when people consciously and constantly reject God's teaching? Why do you think that happens? Psalm 81. Sing aloud to God our strength. Make a joyful shout to the God of Jacob. Raise a song and strike the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the lute. Blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon, at the full moon on our solemn feast day. For this is a statute for Israel, a law of the God of Jacob. This he established in Joseph as a testimony when he went throughout the land of Egypt, where I heard a language I did not understand. I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were freed from the baskets. You called in trouble and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you, O Israel, if you will listen to me. There shall be no foreign god among you, nor shall you worship any foreign god. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. 
But my people would not heed my voice, and Israel would have none of me. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord would pretend submission to him, but their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them also with the finest wheat and with honey. From the rock I would have satisfied you." And Psalm 95. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. For forty years I was grieved with that generation, and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." And question three, why can the way of the wicked sometimes appear more desirable than the counsel of the righteous? We're referred here to Psalm 141. Lord, I cry out to you, make haste to me, give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Let the righteous strike me, it shall be a kindness, and let him rebuke me, it shall be an excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. For still my prayer is against the deeds of the wicked. Their judges are overthrown by the sides of the cliff, and they hear my words, for they are sweet. Our bones are scattered at the mouth of the grave, as when one ploughs and breaks up the earth. But my eyes are upon you, O God, the Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not leave my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares they have laid for me, and from the traps of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets, while I escape safely. That is, how do we deal with the apparent fact that oftentimes the wicked seem to be doing very well? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Sabbath Farewell Party, Part 4 by Andrew McChesney Two weeks after Sekuli's baptism, the Bosnia War erupted. Sekuli fled his boarding high school in Sarajevo, capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and went into hiding for 15 days. When he returned to the dormitory to retrieve his possessions, he found the building had been torched by soldiers. A small library of religious books that he had collected while seeking to find truth had been dumped in the middle of his room and set on fire. He had lost everything. He returned to his home village in Montenegro. News that Sekule had joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church did not sit well with his family. Father could not understand why he had stopped eating meat and took him to a physician. Mother thought a spell had been cast on her son and sought help from someone who practised black magic. When their attempts failed, they sent Sekule to the military. It was 1992 and the Bosnian War was raging. To enlist a son was to send him to war. In those days, families threw big celebrations for newly enlisted soldiers. Sekule's parents planned his party for a Sabbath in December. 200 guests were expected, but Sekule went to church. 
When the winter sun set around 4pm, he returned home. He didn't know what to expect. He thought that the house would be filled with the relatives from across the country and beyond. He thought he would face criticism for not only arriving late to his own party, but also for showing disrespect as the oldest grandson. He found his grandfather on the front porch. Did the people come, Sekule asked. No. 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 Why not? No one knows why. Then people started coming. Sekule asked them, Why are you coming now? They all replied in the same way. Somebody told us to come after 5pm. Who told you? Sekule asked. No one knew. At that moment, Sekule understood that God would protect him and he went to the military. Sekule Sekules is an affluent entrepreneur and faithful Seventh Adventist in Montenegro. Read more of his story next week. And thank you for your Sabbath school mission offerings that help spread the God the good news of Jesus soon coming in Montenegro and around the world. <laughs>